All right. Well, let's roll with um, who's here. I think my favorite things in health transformation work is that whoever shows up is the right group to be there. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. Thanks, everybody, for coming to our almost last um, our almost last learning collaborative call. I'm excited to talk a little bit more in detail about what you can all do to really start implementing and shaping up the vision for value-based pay in your state. So I think this is going to be a fun call, and um, we'll go through a couple things today. I want to spend a little bit of time reviewing our last call and just kind of recapping some of the interventions. Um, I think one of our themes with value-based pay is that it looks slightly different in every state, and there's a lot going on on any one of the components to value-based pay. You could probably, you know, get a whole PhD on. So this collaborative was meant really as an overview to start stimulating the thinking and hopefully some action planning. Um, but I do want to reiterate the just an overview of the content that we went over last time and see if there are any follow-up questions. And then we'll move through a more discussion-based section today talking about what you see as the main needs for value-based pay in your state, looking at who some partners can be in um, either filling those needs for technical assistance or helping convene people to, uh, or helping convene parties, health systems to participate in value-based pay. And then we'll talk about how you want to go about communicating those stops. Opportunities. At the end, I'm going to pass it over to Caleb and Shannon to talk a little bit more about action planning and some of the tools that they have available for that at TAP. So that's an overview of where we're headed today. So as far as looking at um, the results of the surveys and some of you who may have had some time to fill out the state-based resource guide, Later on, we're going to have a discussion question on what you see as the largest unmet need. I wanted to put it in the lecture early just to give you a little bit of time to start thinking about that. So um, before we jump into talking about action planning, I'll ask what you see as the biggest unmet need for value-based pay in your state, and we'll do a round robin on that. But wanted to put the question out early before we do a quick recap of what we talked about last time. All right, so let's revisit where we went with the last lecture, just in case anybody wasn't able to join us last time. So we talked loosely about two types of technical assistance that are needed for value-based pay to get going, and some of the potential areas of overlap with the FLEX program. So on one hand, I think one of the biggest ways FLEX programs can be of use is helping with the education, the strategic planning, and that overall kind of structural technical assistance. Getting your practices to know what kind of alternative payment models are available, should they be reporting NIPs, that's so key to Part B financial sustainability, and how do they connect with other practices in forming an alternative payment model. So, on the other hand, there's kind of the competency side of things. You know, if a practice gets into value-based pay, are they actually going to succeed? Do they have the competencies and the knowledge? So we talked a little bit about quality and alternative payment models, getting accurate data, making a business case, and showing how it impacts the financial health, as well as the actual delivery reform. You know, what are some financially sustainable interventions that you can use to finance and get staff in some of the time that you have to put into value-based pay models. Um, so even though there's different options for alternative payment models, and we talked about how ACOs are pretty much the only option for critical access hospitals based on the way critical access hospitals are reimbursed and the payment models that are out there. Um, but even if you had a proxy who, you know, maybe already had some primary care practices who were active in APMs or other kind of value-based payment, maybe it's a Medicare Advantage value-based payment plan. There are some core elements that no matter what your reimbursement model is and no matter what your payment model is, you're going to want to be competent in. So one is care coordination, and we talked about how billable chronic care management 
is a really key intervention here, providing upwards for rural health clinics of $62 a month per patient um, to have a care coordinator working with them. And fee-for-service is upwards of $40, but you can go all the way up to $200. Um, as a really important path to financial sustainability, we talked about prevention, making sure that your patients are getting annual wellness visits, getting a good picture of what population health looks like is also really important with those hierarchical condition um, codes that we talked about. So if you can do these three things, and you have to be doing all three at once. If you only do care coordination, that's going to help you for a while. But eventually, you know, care coordination is kind of your low-hanging fruit and value-based pay. It's really important, but you're not going to see an increase in savings year over year if you only do care coordination. So you really need to make sure that your hospitals by thinking about how are they going to be competent in all three of these areas. And I think the thing that we wanted to really um, hit home here is though even though you may have already submitted your funding proposals for the next cycle of the FLEX grant, I think there's already some ways that even if you said you were doing a very certain thing, there's some ways to make sure that it incorporates some elements of value-based pay. We see a lot of alignment with the FLEX grant and value-based pay in terms of population health management, financial and operational health, and quality improvement. And offering technical assistance that speaks to these three categories really helps you teach to the top of the class, so to speak. Um, there's all kinds of hospitals that might say, hey, you know, I don't need any board training. I don't need any help with my MD equip measures. But I would really like to know, since I'm doing so well on MD equip, you know, how I can turn the quality results that I'm producing into something that's a little bit more um, value generating. So there's a lot of good overlap with what you're probably already doing in the FLEX program. So today we'll shift a little bit to implementation planning and hopefully have some discussion among us um, to talk about how you can, what pathways you see for channeling um, some of your FLEX efforts into value-based pay if you're seeing a need there. So one of the biggest components that we talked about that even some of the best rural hospitals struggle with is coding and risk adjustment factors. And we talked about this because it's a nationwide rural problem where rural hospitals and rural clinics tend to undercode, meaning when CMS looks at the claims data, they think there is no such thing as rural health disparities because with undercoding, beneficiaries look a lot healthier than they actually are. And that hurt practices or that hurts practices in value-based models. It hurts them in MIPS, it hurts them in ACOs, which are the two big models that are gonna affect critical access to hospitals. Um, because CMS figures that they should have very low cost of care because their beneficiaries look so healthy on paper. So it's important to make sure that all of the diagnostic coding with HCC codes is up to date so that hospitals are getting the maximum reimbursement possible. And again, this is an area where you could do huge amounts of training. I think Kayla mentioned on our last call that her regional extension center in Kentucky provides a lot of training. So hopefully as you all are starting to fill out the state-based value uh, value or the state value based resource template you found some other resources in your state or maybe this is an area you're now planning to incorporate in your flex program um, the bottom line here if you took nothing else away from our discussion about HCC scores last time is that CMS is going to use risk adjustment to play into who's a high value provider who's the low value provider um, you know there's always people publishing on the quality of care in rural America. And so not only is this really important from a reimbursement perspective, but it's also really important in making sure that there's an accurate uh, statement and story out there about the quality of care in rural America. So I want to pause there before we start talking about planning for implementation. Are there any follow-up questions from what we covered last 
time in terms of the competency areas and potential areas for technical assistance. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions coming, so we'll go ahead and shift to talking about planning for implementation. So the three things we wanted to do today is how do you get a picture of what you see the main needs are in your state for value-based pay. Um, identifying some partners who will either help you uh, provide those services or start the discussion. And then talk about ways in which you want to communicate with your hospitals, with other rural stakeholders, with other uh, maybe policy people at the state. It really depends as to what you're already doing and what the potential areas for additional um, communication are. And I want to be really clear here, you know, we want you to leave with actionable steps, but it might be that at this point in time with where your state is, your actionable step is you need more information. Um, so I think there's a whole uh, wide range of actions here that are very valid and could be very helpful to your state. So as we talk about suggestions, I don't want anybody to feel like they have to do one of these or that you can't be creative or go about things in a different way. Um, Value-based pay means so many different things um, based on the populations and kind of the political climates in your state. So I hope that this section is useful in helping you generate some ideas, but please don't feel like you have to to um, marry one of these ideas and write off into the sunset. All right, so I wanted to start with a discussion question that we mentioned earlier. Um, you know, based on the survey results that you saw and your inventory of state resources, if you had time to start that document, what are you seeing as the largest unmet need for supporting your hospitals and value-based pay? And if you're not sure what that need is at this point, what do you think is your next step to further discover what that is? Um, so I'll go ahead and try and do a round robin. And with my screen sharing, I got rid of um, being able to see who's on the line. So um, Shannon, would you be able to help me out and just kind of call names as we do a round robin on this question? Yes, let me just get this pulled up. Um, looks like Jada Lee will be first. Jada, remember, it's star two to unmute your line. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I was actually unmuting. <laughs> okay. No well, uh, as far as as far as the largest unmet need, um, I didn't take a look at the survey results in detail, I need to do that. But just from speaking with people just here on the ground, it's really just a lot of staffing changes and people just not being as trained as they would need to be or have, you know, just losing that almost a continuous use, I'm sorry, losing of the institutional knowledge and just the expertise that's needed because a lot of people don't they don't realize the climate and they don't see the value because because our hospitals have been exempt so I think that's kind of what I've seen and what I've heard uh, from because even a lot of our CEOs they they've changed and it's just um, it's just lacking that continuation. I think that's a, oh, I was going to say that's a really good point too about especially with some of the turnover that we see in rural hospitals with the CEOs. Um, we see that a lot of people who graduated from our TCPI program and moved into ACOs where, um, you know, maybe the first CEO was really progressive and then, you know, went to a different community. The ideas kind of got left behind. The new CEO comes in and needs some re-education. So I think your point on there, Jada, is, is right on. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Lima, you're next. Yeah. 
Star two to unmute your line. Okay, we'll move on to Lisa. Hi, oh, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, this we got this, no worries. Hey, I, I, I muted, but I was double muted. <laughs> um, <laughs> my own um, uh, um, buttons. So uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, what I see from the survey, um, a four surveys that we received out of 13 hospitals, and um, and through my job with the hospitals, I just see a really lack of understanding from um, the CEO, um, from the management of the hospital, uh, hospitals of the value-based pay in general, and. Since there's a really lack of understanding, there's a pushback or not interest, and, uh, not enough interest for that. Uh, I definitely need more education with the on on the on the um, level of hospital itself. Yeah, and I think getting that buy-in is so important to you. And, um, you know, the one thing that I can offer is I'm happy to, if you have a flex advisory board or any kind of regular meeting or want to schedule something, I'm happy to do an informational presentation for your CEOs, clinic administrators, whoever, on kind of what we're seeing on rural and value-based pay, too. I will definitely uh, um, we'll talk through with our partners. We have um, um, a twice a year a meeting where all of the uh, CA um, uh, CEOs and administrators come together in the same room, and um, that's where we get their whole attention. And I will I will brainstorm. Um, how we can actually um, present that information in a kind of a more understandable way that it's easier for them to understand. Uh, there's a lot of read, uh, reading about, about, but I really doubt that anybody goes on and you know researches more about the value-based pay. Yeah, and I think, Lama, you're highlighting another really important point about that, too. In terms of the um, the reading that's out there, first of all, it's, it's all really dense reading, so to speak. And if you just Google um, ACOs or value-based pay or alternative payment models, one of the things that makes it really, really difficult for especially our busy CEOs is that you have so much literature and so many PDFs that are from, you know, 2015 or something from CMS that just haven't been taken down. So it is really difficult to get the right information to your CEOs at the right time. And one of the things that I always like to do when I'm starting to work with a community is um, kind of run their numbers for them. Because I think if you can come up with a brief presentation saying, you know, based on your population, these are probably the needs. This is the revenue that you would stand to gain. These are the outcomes you could realize. And make it really action-oriented and about them. Um, I think it's always helpful. So I'd be excited to take a look at some of that CMS data on the number of Medicare beneficiaries in Nevada and see if, um, you know, maybe I can be helpful in putting together some numbers on that as well. That would be wonderful. Great. All right. Do we have one more, two more people on, Shannon? Yeah, I believe Lisa's up next. Hey, this is Lisa. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, well, uh, probably our just looking at our results, we had a small sample set to look at. So I'm not really going to base a whole lot of my thoughts based off of the survey. Probably an opportunity to know 
to reach back out and resurvey at a different time. I think a lot of fiscal years are ending right now, so we're having a lot of difficulty even getting with our hospitals. But um, areas that, that we saw is really to try to look at more of that transitional care management. Um, the ones that did respond scored that lower. Um, and so I think that's an important thing for us to focus on. Uh, we have several critical access hospitals in our state that are involved in ACOs and really drawing them out to see what their experience has been and what their success is and have them share that with our other critical access hospitals is probably um, one of my next steps to consider. Um, I think, again, just a little bit more information about what it means for our uh, individual hospitals, the ones that um, have physicians as part of their um, book of business, they own those physician practice. I think it's even more critical for them to really be looking at these options to see if they are really leveraging the opportunity to get the best on patient care and receive the extra value from a payment standpoint. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, Lisa, you're highlighting again um, another important difference there with uh, those who own physicians versus those who don't, and for their kind of strategic future thinking, too, about how they're going about their business. I mean, absolutely what we've seen in the value-based care models is that if you have primary care as a part of your book of business, or if you own your physicians, even your hospitalists that are working in the hospital, it's a lot easier to um, it's a lot easier to have an impact and a really sustainable path in value-based care. I think there's a way to make it work for everyone, but um, for those hospitals that have primary care clinics. Especially, um, you know, it's a, it's a lot easier path. So I think that's another good point that you bring up too. All right, and then did I see is Stephanie the next person on my list? I think so. Right. I don't know. I'm going to... Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so this is Stephanie in Idaho. Mary isn't here today. So um, I, it's sort of hard to say where to go forward because um, this is still pretty nebulous for me. But um, I think that we have work to do regardless in the population health arena as far as really understanding where our critical access hospitals are working and how best to support that. Um, like many others, the survey was not incredibly helpful because there was just such few results. Um, and the questions don't really allude to much. They're just sort of broad. Um, so I do think what I'll do is um, what we had intended to do anyway was when I go out on site visits, having a more detailed conversation to try and assess needs and figure out exactly where everybody is with population health, because I have not done that. Um, and uh, encouraging to get a baseline even through that National Rural Health Resource Center um, assessment and trying to figure out how this kind of plays into um, what we're talking about. And then with regard to, uh, and, I, and I say that because of the few hospitals that did answer, quite a few said that they don't have any plans for measuring population health and they don't have, that they may have a baseline data, but they don't really know how to improve or they might be trying to improve. So that's kind of where I would target first. And then with regard to MIPS, um, we've been reliant on our QIN uh, to be providing all of that education. So I was pretty heavily involved on the front end because there were so many questions coming in, but it is so complex that we've sort of let them take the lead. But we have since, since I've come back from a couple of site visits um, before we started this webinar series, realized that 
it's probably best to circle back around with them anyway and see how we can coordinate and collaborate um, to help ensure that these hospitals are uh, involved and not missing opportunities, not getting penalized for, for some of this work. And then probably the last approach that I'll take, um, and again, obviously talking with Mary, uh, is that we do quite a bit of billing and coding training for rural health clinics. But I think um, looking at some of those codes that you mentioned uh, for chronic care management and that sort of thing, um, making sure that even during site visits that I'm talking with hospitals who may own primary care clinics and making sure that they are aware um, of some of those, the coding piece and trying to connect those dots so that they don't leave money on the table. Um, so I think that's probably where we'll start. All right, Stephanie, yeah, I think that's a, that's a very solid plan. I think you have a gold star for how is it all planned out. Because I think, to your point, that survey was pretty broad, and population health is such a trend term these days, it can mean so many different things. I think just as an example on the survey, um, one of the things that really surprised me was that question where we asked about, you know, are you providing any of the following population health services, chronic care management, transitional care management, even those terms, which, you know, I put in kind of on purpose as vague. Um, but some of them do correspond to specific CMS billing codes, as you were just saying. Um, we had a ridiculously high amount of people or hospitals that respond to the survey report that they are billing chronic care management. I guarantee you, we do not have like over 60% of folks actually billing for <laughs> chronic care management. Right. So um, I love your point about sitting down and going more in depth with folks. Because I think, you know, with the survey, you can kind of grab people's attention and say, hey, this is the topic we're talking about. But doing the work on exactly what did you mean when you said that and almost having a checklist just because you can take population health in so many different directions is a really good idea. So I love that idea. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Is there anyone else on the line today? Even oh. us as well. Yeah, I'm here. I'm still in agenda with the Missouri Hospital Association. And based on the survey results, um, there's a few things which were evident. Uh, there's a gap in terms of how many are participating uh, in the MIPS, uh, which is a concern. And so one of the key things is trying to educate uh, the critical access hospitals about the financial implications for them today and in the future because it's going to uh, keep increasing on how much they are not, uh, the penalties that they get. And so that's a good study point. And I think something which is very evident uh, as well is uh, trying to educate more about uh, the connection between uh, the care coordination piece, transition of care, population health management, and prevention, just so that there's a good understanding of how a gap or a lapse in one of those uh, can have implications from um, uh, from that perspective. Uh, and one of the things that we have uh, done uh, towards the end of last year, beginning of 2018 is uh, there is a survey, population health assessment survey that we had done to try to gauge uh, the critical access hospitals and other hospitals in general how uh, well they are positioned in terms of uh, population health management, gather that information about where they are in the transition of uh, from volume to volume. And so with that information that we gathered from that survey, we did uh, do a population uh, maturity scale on the population health uh, management side. And so the gaps identified were sent to each hospital. And in fact, 
uh, we've been sending those results back to them and trying to see how we can best uh, uh, gather a little bit more information on how we can be able to help them close the gaps. Several webinars have been done here internally uh, at the Hospital Association to try to educate them a little bit more about the gaps and opportunities that they have. But uh, as uh, somebody mentioned um, at some point during the presentation is there's a lot of information out there. Some of it might be uh, outdated and so I think having an opportunity to see if there's um, a hub or a place where we can be able to pull information uh, very specific which is uh, most up to date and trying to pass on that and educating the different individuals within those hospitals involved that have some stake uh, in the, um, the value uh, on that continuum would be very key in uh, helping position them into uh, a very good position. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. And I think your point around the gaps and education that goes with the gaps is really key because I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, when we're talking about maybe it's just quality metrics and people see pneumonia vaccination as only a quality metric, helping yeah. connect the dots to them and saying, you know, this may look like it's only a quality metric, it's only what we're pulling out of your EHR, but preventing hospitalization from pneumonia is a huge opportunity for hospitals going into an accountable care organization or things like that or, you know, gaps and you're not providing chronic care management in a structured way, but you could. Or, like, I think a lot of people just see the gaps as gaps, but really helping paint the picture of how those gaps relate to the larger continuum of population health. Um, one of the points that I just really want to hit home is I talk with a lot of hospitals in more progressive states, for instance, maybe Minnesota, where they've been doing care coordination for a long time. And, you know, they get frustrated in alternative payment models because, you know, they've been doing care coordination for such a long time. And, well, that is really progressive. Uh, like I said, care coordination is only kind of the low-hanging fruit in an ACO type of model where you're trying to realize those shared savings. It's a really great thing to be doing. I don't want to um, undermine that at all. But unless you take that really larger larger picture of public health approach where you're looking at vaccination rates, you're preventing fall risk, or, or you're preventing falls, things like that, um, you really need everything and that population health approach as a whole to make progress. So I think, Stephen, you bring up an excellent point there. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And did we get everyone, Shannon? All right. everyone. Perfect. Um, so I think um, back to what Stephanie was saying around really finding out what your hospitals were doing. Um, one of the things that I think you can kind of use as a guide if you're just having quick conversations, maybe you've got a little bit longer of a time on a site visit, is that if you're not exactly sure of what the needs are, um, or to Jada's point, if you're doing education, I think this is a really good kind of top 10 list of what you can ask your hospital CEOs or maybe their associated um, chief nursing officers, financial officers, whoever this falls with, to see where exactly their needs are for value-based pay. Um, so making sure that they've checked, checked their MIPS reporting eligibility, um, asking more specifically what is their strategy for reducing costs and improving outcomes, um, asking if they're doing chronic care management, and then secondly, are they billing for it? Because I have a lot of hospitals that will say, yeah, we're doing chronic care management, and then you ask them what they mean by that, and they're like, yeah, we're calling patients to follow up, but they're not doing any billing, they don't have any kind of structured care plan. Um, so really pinning people down on the specifics, I think, is really important to making sure they've got the maximum benefit. Um, wellness visits, one of the things that I find really interesting about our Medicare population 
is that even though um, you know wellness visits can be done by a nurse for the majority of the time, and they're reimbursed at the same visit as any other um, kind of level one E and M visit, most Medicare beneficiaries don't get this visit. I think the national statistic is that only about 20% of Medicare beneficiaries nationwide get a wellness visit. So going back to what we're talking about with population health and making sure you're taking care of those preventive metrics, whether it's pneumonia vaccination, fall risk screening, depression screening, the wellness visit is a really great billable opportunity for that, and it can help practices kind of wrap up all of those um, more population health type interventions. Um, and then seeing what critical access hospitals are doing to address social determinants of health. I think one of the easiest things that a hospital can do is just go to their local 211 page and print out a guide of social services and at a minimum have that available for every staff member so that no matter kind of at what point a social determinant need is revealed by a patient, somebody knows where to go to at least get them a starting point. And then on the data side of things, ask them when the last time they did any kind of coding, training, or audit was. Um, you know, what, what are their results? What's their average HCC score? Um, any hospital who looks at their quality and resource use report should be able to tell you what their average HCC score is. Um, looking at um, running reports on quality, and so obviously you have folks doing the regular MB equip reporting, but especially if they have a provider-based outpatient clinic, having them look at how well they're doing quality, and then asking them what they do with the quality reports. Um, you know, one of the things I've found is that people will have a really good IT person who runs their EHR report on a monthly or quarterly basis, but they never have time to do the follow-up on, okay, if the metric wasn't where we want it to be, what did we do with it? Um, so making sure they've also got a, prop, or a process there for controlling quality. And then lastly, looking at the infrastructure side of things, if you find that you have a hospital kind of doing all of these top things under quality and data, but they are kind of at a stopping point on how far they can progress with value-based payment because they don't have enough beneficiaries or they don't have any partners to get that number of beneficiaries, they're kind of going to plateau there. And you really want value-based pay to be acceptable because you can use, once you have enough beneficiaries, as leveraging to be able to work with Medicare Advantage plans. If you get enough rural hospitals in a room, you could probably um, use it to leverage negotiating with some of the commercial plans as well. So as long as um, you have a body of hospitals, critical access hospitals, and provider-based clinics to have enough beneficiaries or patients to make the metrics meaningful. Um, everybody is under the same pressure these days to be moving towards population health and control the cost of care. So if you have um, a group of health systems who want to be partners in negotiating insurance contracts, it could be included incredibly valuable to them as well. So if you are going on a site visit and have a little bit more time to um, go in depth with folks, this is something that I would recommend as a starting point, just to learn a little bit more about what the results were in those surveys. Um, so in terms of these categories here, I think we talked a little bit already what was um, going on underway. So we won't do the types and thing. Um, but be thinking of, you know, what of these areas have you already worked on? How did it go? What's your next step? And as you're looking at your top needs, um, think about if there's anything that you want to revisit here or break into for the first time. All right. So as far as, you know, action items, Caleb's going to talk a little bit more about the action planning. But as we're going through these slides in the three categories, feel free to jot down just some areas that you want to be working on them 
or areas you want to be working on and how you want to address them. So the second area that we want to talk about is identifying partners. And this kind of goes down to the infrastructure category of things as well as extending the technical assistance that you're able to provide. Um, so there's, like I said, kind of two ways that you want to think about partners. One, partners for technical assistance, and then two, partners for being able to group hospitals together to negotiate for value-based pay or help each other out uh, peer learning and value-based pay. So the agencies that are listed in bold here on the slide, and I know I didn't pick a, a real bold font for this, it's a little hard to tell, but um, hospital associations, I think even your great example of that, rural health associations, primary care associations, quality networks, depending on what's already in your state, these are agencies that are used to kind of getting folks together around some of these ideas and formalizing into collaboratives. And they might be really good partners in starting a discussion. Jade is on the line um, as well with Mississippi, where you know Mississippi Hospital Association said we want to have all of our you know, or we want to sponsor practices getting into an ACO. Um, so that's kind of how they got some of the um, partners together there. I think Stephen from Missouri, you had kind of a similar situation there where the hospital association helped convene. Um, you know, if you know John Crystal of the Michigan Center for Rural Health, they're another great example of, um, in this case, the Center for Rural Health being able to convene hospitals into an ACO. So there's a lot of different partners that you can look at for um, helping convene practices to get that threshold of beneficiaries. Um, if you want to go into an alternative payment model, those arrangements always take a lot of time. Um, so being able to think about how that goes ahead of time and plan out. Usually, if you're going into an alternative payment model, those applications are due in July, but you need to have your network formalized before that. So definitely think into the future. And I don't know, um, Jada or Stephen, if you want to share a little bit about um, kind of from either of your states how that process went with the hospital association convening folks into the ACO. Um, if you have anything to say on that, feel free to share. Otherwise, I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, <laughs> that's OK. No, I know that they brought in Caravan, which is an ACO, uh, uh, I guess, agency. Uh, who did the information session, which a lot of the hospitals actually came and they were able to come and ask questions. And you know, it wasn't like like you guys were talking about before, just getting something in the mail or getting some, getting an email. They were actually able to ask questions and see how see what the value was. So I think that did clear up some of that resistance that we had before. So I think that helped a lot. But I know some things have happened since then that I probably have not been necessarily as a part of, but that's what, what I saw. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a really good point about getting folks in the room so that they can interact and hear each other's concerns, especially because I think one of the alarming things for rural going into something like an ACO where you need partners is that They've been independent for so long, and they're proud of their independence. It's kind of alarming for them to think about, gosh, we're going to, you know, jump into something with other folks. So having, you know, a, a forum where you're comfortable, like the hospital association, where they're all kind of used to working together, I think can be really positive and getting everybody in the room as 
opposed to just emailing. So thanks for sharing that data. Thanks, Bob. All right, uh, this is uh, Steven Jenga with the Missouri Host Association. And I'm very sure there has been conversations uh, with the CEOs uh, because they meet here at the hosp hospital association every so often. And the individual who uh, deals with the financial and operational component of the FLEX uh, program is the one who um, organizes on the discussions uh, on the agenda and inviting people who uh, the leaderships of those hospitals ought to listen to. And I'm very sure there's been a conversation about uh, ACO, but I don't have all the details as to uh, who presented and how the discussion went, but there has been that interest with critical access hospitals in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. And I think, you know, having that convening place can be really helpful. And if you aren't in a state where any of your associations, whether it's the Primary Care Association, Rural Health Association, Hospital Association, has put out anything on value-based pay, I think it's worth um, just sending an exploratory email saying, you know, hey, we recently did this survey. This is what we found. We're trying to round out our results um, by finding a little bit more about what our stakeholders are doing. Have you considered value-based pay in the past? Um, and I think more and more, like I've recently been talking with some state Medicaid departments, some insurance companies that are really interested in getting rural more involved in value-based pay. So even if somebody hasn't reached out to you already to ask your opinion, I, I guarantee you this is a topic that folks are interested in. Um, I think HRSA networks um, are another really good um, partner for getting the word out, as well as practice transformation networks. If you're interested in what's going on practice transformation-wise with the CMS Innovation Center in your state, um, pretty much all of the practice transformation networks are um, really friendly. If you want to know kind of who's active in your state, there's a map that's available online. I'm also happy to connect you if you want to know about like, who's preparing for value-based pay and what this kind of that precursor to ACOs looks like. I'm always happy to talk about that. Um, so in terms of reaching out, like I said, I would recommend kind of summarizing your survey results, sharing the, those with folks, and just asking, you know, have you considered supporting value-based pay activities in the past? Do you have any future plans or goals? And, you know, how, if you have done anything, how have your stakeholders reacted? So those are just some suggested questions. Feel free to pick your own. The last thing I want to talk about before I hand it over to Caleb to talk a little bit more about next steps is just the communication opportunities. Um, and I think in Jada's story about Mississippi, she highlighted a really important point about how you present this data is, or not this data, but this topic is so important because I think um, nobody ever really wants to do anything new, especially something like value-based pay, where sometimes there's risk. It requires new partnerships, new relationships. Um, you know, with everything that goes on in rural hospitals, they usually got enough issues that you know they want to put this on, on the back shelf. So providing a forum where you can get engagement is really important. Um, so. Maybe it's that you're sending out another survey. You're doing what Stephanie's doing in Idaho, where you're having face-to-face -face visits. Um, you want to make an issue brief so you can start shopping that around to maybe your insurance companies or primary care offices or hospital associations and things like that. Um, you know, maybe by some miracle you have hospital CEOs that read their email. Um, just think about how it's usually best to reach folks and start 
um, start putting information out. Um, I think this is a topic, kind of to Stephen's point, where you definitely have discussions and things build over time. Um, so don't be discouraged if at your first reaction nobody really seems interested. I think value-based pay is ultimately the path for rural financial sustainability. So starting that conversation early will be a huge benefit to the long-term financial health and population health outcomes in your state. Um, and start thinking about who you want to target initially. I mean, do you want to start this conversation with your hospital CEOs? If you are an office of rural health that also has primary care involvement, you want to start to on the primary care side of things. Um, think about who you're targeting first. Maybe for you, it's starting with state Medicaid and asking what their vision is. It really depends on what's going on in your state. Um, if you want any help or further discussion on this, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about implementation in our last call um, next week. But please always feel free to reach out. At this point, you all have my contact information, so I'm happy to chat further. Um, but the action item that you want to focus on here is pick up a communication method and select a target date. You know, maybe it's like Lima saying where you've got two meetings a year and maybe that meeting isn't for six months, but get it on the calendar now. Um, so that's just another suggested action item. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Caleb to talk a little bit about the next steps, and we'll go from there. Uh, well, thank you, Maeve. And I, I don't have a whole lot to add. A fair amount of what I wanted to say is exactly what Maeve was talking about for, for next steps in the action planning. Um, we really want to, to support you guys in your efforts. We have an action plan template down here in the, in the file sharing folder, and it will also be posted to Moodle if it's not there yet, which is um, just an opportunity or a, an easy template for you guys to be able to um, to fill in some of those gaps to be able to write down some of that, um, those efforts that Maeve was talking about. 